Theodore Van Kirk, U.S. Army Air Corps, not the Air Force, Air Corps. I flew out of England, I flew out of North Africa, I flew out of the, I only have one mission in the Pacific. I grew up in a small town in Pennsylvania. Uh, town is called Northumberland, Pennsylvania. And it's right where the west, north and west branch of the Susquehanna Rivers meet in Pennsylvania. And I had practically a Huckleberry Finn life type of thing. My father operated a coal dredge. You don't know what that is, but they would wash the coal up the river in Scranton and Wilkes-Barre. It would come down the river. The Redger River would have a classifying action on the, on the coal, and he would dig it out of the river and sell it for $2 a ton in a, an automatic digger. And my job was pushing boats up empty flats up the river and bringing full flats down. And lo and, be, lo and behold, if I ever ran one aground, too, that's all I'll say. But uh, anyhow, that was uh, basically what I did. And, uh, and I might say I was a river rat. Everybody at that time, and at, at that, uh, about my age, at, at that time of their life, uh, you know, we, had, we weren't in the war when I entered, but you know, you didn't have to be very smart to figure out that we were going to be. Everybody seemed to know it except Congress and the President. And uh, so I just decided I'd rather fly than uh, walk around the mud. I was in college for one year before I joined. So if you were in college, there was a discussion, uh, discussions going on about it. And, uh, but compared to what we have today, we had no news at all. I had never been further away than about uh, 60 miles, you know, we didn't, we didn't go to Europe for summer vacation and that sort of thing back in those days. And uh, so uh, it was a brand new experience to me. And, uh, uh, but uh, how was it like? It was getting on the train with a bunch of other guys and going to your first flying school. That's it. Well, we got in the train. We went to Sykes, Missouri. Uh, we get off. We were at a primary flying school. And three days later, I was flying an airplane. And I'm, I'm with an instructor, of course, and maybe Two weeks later, I was soloing an airplane. We were very nonchalant about uh, thinking about uh, being in the war. We, uh, uh, you know, after, after, after I was accepted, I had to take a, a competitive exam to get in, and they told me I passed it, and after I was accepted, they still didn't call me up for, for almost a year. So they were very nonchalant about uh, all the training and everything else. We didn't have any, and you have to understand, back in those days, we didn't have anything. You know, we had, when I finally got out and got to, got to, went to B-17s and everything, our B-17s were so beat up we could hardly get them up to 18,000 feet and things of this type. It was completely unlike it is now. You people, the people today, the young people today don't even understand what, what it was like back in those days. On the final days of flying school, I failed my final flying exam, and uh, so I was going to get back out. That under the Under the laws of those days, if you washed out of flying school, you were an aviation cadet, they had to let you back out. So I was going to get back out and join the RAF. Mm -hmm. And uh, some elderly old Captain Air retread from World War I called me in and was talking to me and he says, Mr. Van Kirk, he says, I understand you're going to join the RAF. And I said, yes, sir, there are my plans. And he said, you do and you're going to be dead within a year. So he said, uh, so I said, I would like to, and he says, I would suggest you go to navigation school instead. So, it, you know, if I had the choice of going to navigation school or being dead, I'll take navigation school every time. As soon as Pearl Harbor comes in, everything they've got very military, and we had to always wear European uniform. I was ticked off because I just bought a bunch of new civilian clothes, and I, I no longer could wear them. All I could do with my new civilian clothes is pack them up and send them home. I completed my navigation training. I went through navigation school in half time. That, that was the other thing they did. They had a, a group being trained ready to go over to Europe and, uh, and uh, no navigators. So we th went through the school in half time. Then the whole class, or practically the whole class graduated, which is only about 30 of us. Uh, all were sent to the 97th bomb group down at Sarasota, Florida, which was a bad place to be stationed, by the way. And a uh, brand new field, we had no quarters there or anything of that type. We had to live in town. And uh, so we trained there for several months and then, uh, then we take off for Europe. And we went to Europe, uh, I uh, get a kick out of it because uh, Paul Tibbetts just had his 83rd, well a year ago, a little over a year ago, had his 83rd birthday party out here at Peachtree. 
he and Pat Epps had the same birthday. And so Pat was giving him his uh, birthday party, and the uh, thing they were celebrating was the, the, quote, Bolero movement. They had a lot of airplanes they wanted to get over to Europe and no way to get them there. So the B-17s became navigation ships, and four P-38s flew on each B-17 wing. Of course, you put some on the ice in Greenland, too, and they're the ones Pat Epps was involved in digging out. That's how he got involved in all this. But uh, anyhow, we trained down there. Then we formed the Bolero movement. We had to go around and get our planes modified and make sure we had the, the guns worked and everything of that type. And uh, then we went over to England. We're stationed in England for a while. We joke about it now and everything. Paul Tibbetts and I do. He's the only one that is still living. Tom Furby's dead. But uh, we joke about it. Our time in England was on the job training. It really was. Our crew was selected to take Mark Clark down to Gibraltar to pay off the French so that they would not resist the North African invasions. And I passed all this gold through my hands and I said, God, what is this stuff? It's very heavy. And they said, oh, it's ammunition. It was gold to pay off the French. Coming back from Gibraltar on that trip was probably the worst weather I've ever flown in my life. And uh, I kept putting myself to the left because I knew the Germans to the right. And uh, I kept putting myself to the left, and I guess I guessed right because uh, when we get up there, we saw a small island, and uh, and uh, Timbits called me and he says, "Dutch, do you know where you're at?" And I says, "Hell no." And he says, "You think you know where you're at?" And I said, "I think I know pretty close," but I said, "If you want a guarantee, I won't give you one." and this sort of stuff. And he says, well, that island down there, is that the Isle of Man? He says, uh, no, I says, that's not the Isle of Man. I know that much anyhow. And uh, Mark Clark was saying up there saying, you know, that's not the Isle of Man, is it? You know, they're controlled by the Germans and everything of this type. So Paul turned to Mark Clark and said, well, we'll stop down circle a few times. Then the Germans will start shooting at us and then we'll know where we're at. And then maybe uh, two weeks later when uh, we went down to an airport called Hearn, and we were selected at that time, uh, along with five other planes in our crew, to take General Eisenhower and his staff down to Gibraltar to command the invasion. Get down there, we had six B-17s down there, so we thought we should, you know, we should do some good. So uh, uh, we, 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 we had flown, we'd left the, uh, Gibraltar already and flown Mark Clark over to uh, Algiers to take command, and we landed there. They were bombing the base. That's uh, one. Of the, that's a different story, however. But we had six, six B-17s. So Tibbets went into the group captain there and said, "You know, we have six B-17s. We could bomb something and may may do the war some good." So the guy says, "Oh yes, uh, yes, yes. Uh, 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 we, we, we'd like to have Brazerte bomb. I don't even know what Brazerte was, for heaven's sakes." And uh, so the guy arranged to give us a bomb on a bomb truck and trailer. So we had to carry our own bombs from the docks out to the field and load them. We had to carry our own gasoline out from the docks out to the field and refuel our B-17s out of five gallon cans and then fly the mission. And then I, when we were ready to fly the mission, I went back to the group captain, the, the British group captain who was commanding the area and, uh, for the air, for air force, air, for the air. And I said, I don't have any maps. Where's Brazerte? And he says, well, we can find you one. And he's saying his aid out, and his aid come back with a standard oil road map. And that's what I used to navigate the first mission in North Africa. And the story gets even better. Tibbets later was over in NATO, and when he was introduced to some of the German officers uh, who were also in NATO at the time, uh, they said, oh, yes, we've heard of you, General T Colonel T I guess he was a colonel at the time, Colonel Tibbetts. We've heard of you. And he says, why? They says, well, you've mom Bazerte. <coughs> Paul says, yes. And he says, you don't know it, but you've wiped out practically a whole German squadron of pilots and everything who were in the mess hall one day, and one of your bombs hit the mess hall. So it's better to be lucky than good. That's all I'll say. One thing I always remember. Uh, the, uh, we were sitting at Gibraltar when the uh, invasion fleet, the part that was going to invade Oran and Algiers, when the invasion fleet steamed through the Straits of Gibraltar, moonlight night, up in the rock, watching this 
big armada. We thought big armada ships at that time. Actually, on D-Day, they had a lot more. But at that time, I'd never seen so many ships in my life. And to see that, those ships steaming through the Gulf of the, the Straits there at the Gulf of Gibraltar was just a picture I'll never forget. It's one of the easiest missions I ever flew in my life. Uh, much easier than flying over Germany because the Japanese weren't shooting at us, the Germans were. But uh, I'll go back and tell the whole story about how I got into it because uh, um, I was at the time at a navigation school over at Monroe, Louisiana, a squadron commander teaching other people how to be navigators, I think. And uh, I got a call from Paul Tibbetts that he had been given command of his group and he says they wanted me to be group group navigator, and he got Tom Ferby as group bombardier. So uh, I said yes and that sort of thing. And to this day, Paul and I still argue. He says, well, you volunteered for that job. I says, yeah, but when I got my damn orders, they were dated two days before my your telephone call. That's not so much for the volunteering. But anyhow, I went out and we joined, I joined them out at Wendover Field, and we trained out there. Our training was nothing uh, unusual. What do we have to do to get away from the bomb? We were not worried about the Japanese. We were not worried about Japanese defenses or anything of that type. We were worried about the bomb blowing up the airplane. And I can remember one of the first times we had with scientists, they said, we think the airplane will be okay if you're nine miles, at least nine miles away when the bomb explodes. Well, the only problem was in a regular B-29, we couldn't get nine miles away. So uh, we decided to use stripped down B-29s, which was gun B-29s we took all the guns out, all the turrets out except the tail guns, and took a lot of the radio equipment out and everything. So the major purpose of that was so we could get up higher, go faster, and get away from the ball. And that's all we did. Uh, there are a lot of interesting things about that period of time. Most of them uh, uh, did not involve the training, uh, although we did take a whole group down to Batista Field, Cuba, for training down there out over the water, out over the South Atlantic there where uh, uh, they couldn't tune in on radio stations and listen to the ball game while they were homing on get, how to get home and everything of that type. They they had to learn their navigation out there. But uh, a lot of it concerned over its security and uh, things of that type. And uh, we were doing all this training, incidentally. We had 15, 15 bombing crews and 15 B-29s trained to drop atomic weapons. And uh, we didn't have anything to drop. The, the, the Manhattan Project still hadn't developed a bomb. And if they did develop it, they didn't know how, whether it was going to work or not. Then about, they, they all, we took the whole group overseas. We were over there at Tinny Ann. And then they had the explosion, the test explosion in New, in, uh, New Mexico, out of Alamogordo, where they put the uh, bomb, and it was a your plutonium bomb, put it on the tower and exploded it, and then he now says, yeah, we now think we have a weapon, and uh, you can start preparing to drop it. But we'd been preparing for the last several months. Um, it was about that time then that Washington started getting into it. They gave us a lot of, not, not Washington per se, it was Washington Leslie Groves, period. And they told us what we had to do when we dropped the bomb. We had to drop it visually. We couldn't take it up there and drop it by radar. We had to drop instruments at the same time we dropped the bomb so that they would measure the force of the blast. And uh, oh, we had to get pictures and everything of that type. And so we just made our plans to do that. And we took seven airplanes on the whole on, on that actual mission. We had uh, three airplanes. That we had assigned target cities, too. They were cities that hadn't been bombed before by any other means so that uh, There'd be no argument afterwards where the damage was caused by fire bombs, high explosive bombs, iron bombs, we call them, or the atomic bomb. And um, so we had three airplanes, three, three planes out over those three, three of those cities, and they would ra radio the information back to us so that we didn't have to go up there and stooge around going, first go to Hiroshima, and if weather wasn't clear there, go to Kokur, and that sort of thing. So we had good weather information, and the information over all three cities was clear, so Hiroshima was the first one we wanted to hit. The reason we wanted to hit that was it had 100 numbered military targets in it, the most important of which was the headquarters of 
one of the Japanese armies. I forget the number of the army. But it was the army uh, that was charged with the defense of Japan in case of invasion. And it was also the port where most of the Japanese materiel was being sent over to Kaihoshu to being set up to repel the invasion in case we had to invade. That's the reason why we wanted to bomb that one first. So um, we finally, after making all these plans and everything, we uh, uh, got word that President Truman had approved the use of the bomb and we should go ahead and drop it at our first convenience, which to us was the day the weather was good. And then we had a lot of briefings. Everybody, everybody wants to know that we know what we were doing. Hell yes, we knew what we were doing, insofar as they knew. They, you know, they, they, they didn't know either. We, they, I found out later a lot of the scientists when we, when we left were sorry to see us go because they didn't think we were coming back. I expected to come back, I'll tell you that. And, uh, but um, there were scientists there that were saying that it would start a chain reaction in the atmosphere and everything of that type. So, you know, but they couldn't tell us exactly, but as much as they could tell us, we knew and what to, and what to expect and how to handle it and everything else. So, um, come August 6th, first day the weather was good, we had our briefings and everything, and uh, then they told us to come back and get some sleep. Um, how they expected to tell you you're going out and drop an atomic bomb, then go get some sleep, I have absolutely no idea. I know I didn't sleep, Fairbury didn't sleep, Tibbetts didn't sleep. We were all in the same poker game, that's how I know that. <laughs> And uh, then about 11 o'clock or 10, 11 o'clock at night, they called us for a final briefing and then a final breakfast. Uh, and I know, do know what we had for breakfast because Tibbetts always used to like pineapple fritters. I hated the damn things. Uh, but anyhow, we had pineapple fritters for breakfast that morning. And then down to the field. And uh, when we get down to the plane, that was our first surprise because, you know, keg lights all over everything. and. Uh, I looked at it and said, it looks like a Hollywood premiere. Uh, Dick Nelson, our radio operator who came from Southern California, looked at it and he says, nah, looks like a supermarket is opening to me. <laughs> but anyhow, there are a lot of people around uh, interviewing, asking questions. But the thing I want to emphasize here that all of this was being done for the Manhattan Project. There was not a media person on the island of, of Tinian. Uh, we first media people we see we we didn't even see them on Tinian. We had to go down to uh, Guam in order to meet them down there. Only one media person on the island, Bill Lawrence, the New York Times, and uh, he had agreed to uh, to be in on a lot of this stuff for the Manhattan Project, but uh, not to write anything and publish anything until after they gave him permission to do so, and that's the reason he was there. It's funny, the second mission to uh, Nagasaki, uh, the, uh, Paul told us, uh, Tom Ferby and I, they said, uh, Bill's going to fly in the second mission. They, they, they told us, you guys get him all the equipment he needs. So we gave him every piece of equipment the Air Force had. Poor old Bill Lawrence couldn't hardly stand up by the time we got, hung all that equipment on him and everything of that type. Well, anyhow, coming back to our Hiroshima mission, um, uh, we finally did all those interviews and everything, and uh, then we got in the airplane to take off. The takeoff was tricky because we were extremely heavily loaded. And uh, of course, I had all the faith in Paul Tibbetts. He's an outstanding pilot. He got it off the ground, and we stayed a low altitude till we got to uh, Iwo Jima because uh, Navy Captain Parsons was going to go back in the bomb bay and arm the bomb in flight. Chuck Sweeney was on one wing, and. George Marquardt was on our other wing. Chuck had the uh, instruments in his plane. Marquardt had the photo camera in his plane. And uh, start slowly, slowly climbing to Japan. And you know, I could see the weather was perfect. Easy mission. I, I could look out and I could see the coastline of Japan from probably 100 miles away at that altitude. I could pick out the city of Hiroshima from 75 miles away at least. Uh, so uh, we went in across the island of Shikoku, across the uh, uh, inland sea uh, to just west of uh, Hiroshima where he turned on the IP and uh, I mean the, yeah the initial point and uh, you know like I see I was going to be close to the time we were supposed to drop at 915 so I thought well I'm going to try to get as close as possible and uh, so I extended the IP a little bit to use up a little more time and we ended up dropping we dropped at 915 and 15 seconds 
Uh, Chuck Sweeney lagged back of us a little bit by about five miles or so, and the instruments dropped out of his plane when the bomb dropped out of ours. Uh, George Markhart made a big circle and lagged us by about, uh, oh, 25 miles. But the cam camera didn't work, so we didn't get any pictures of that. We made the turn that we had practiced many, many times and how to get away from the bomb. 150 degree turn and put the nose down, push the throttles forward, and just run like the devil. And we were about 12 miles away when the bomb exploded. 43 seconds from the time the bomb left our plane until it exploded at about 1,800 feet. bomb exploded, we knew it exploded because bright flash in the airplane. Didn't hear anything, couldn't hear a thing over the roar of the motors, but you saw the bright flash in the airplane. And so you knew it had exploded and then very shortly thereafter we got uh, uh, the very first shock wave which was, uh, you know, it felt like, it felt like you were flying over, when you're flying over Europe, you had a very close flak burst right under the wing or something of that type. And it was measured at about two and a half to three G's. That doesn't seem like much, but if you're in a B-29 at 30,000 feet, it's a pretty damn good jolt. And uh, uh, somebody called Flack, I don't know who it was, it wasn't me. And uh, it had to be the tippets for Fairview, and they both say it wasn't them either, but that's all right. And uh, <coughs> by that time we called the tail gunner, and the tail gunner says, it wasn't a Flack, it was a shock wave, here comes another one, and by that time the second one hit the plane. A little bit less strong than the first one, but uh, uh, so anyhow, the plane was still flying. We were all in one piece and everything of that type, so we, we, we knew we had a successful mission. So then we turned to take a look at what had happened, and all we could see of the city of Hiroshima was <coughs> the black smoke dust, look a pot of boiling oil covering the city. And then we, um, the, the cloud, you have to, mushroom cloud. You've seen pictures of it, it already formed. It was up well above our altitude already, up to maybe 40,000 feet or so, and uh, it's still going. And so we flew around in the southeast quadrant of the city to see what we could observe. Couldn't see anything because of the smoke and dust. So we turned around and went home. But uh, you could still see that cloud 267 miles away. Well, we were about 15,000 feet. That's how high, that's how high the white cloud went that day. And uh, we get home. There wasn't anything special about that, except that number one, they had a party with free beer and free hot dogs. I didn't get a free hot dog. I got back late. Uh, but there are more generals there than admirals than any place I'd ever seen in my life. And it's the first time I've ever been debriefed by a four-star general, for heaven's sakes. So that was our mission. Very easy. Everything was planned out well. Everything went exactly according to plan, and so it all seemed easy. We dropped the only U-235 bomb ever dropped, and we used all the uranium ever made at Oak Ridge, Tennessee, up to that time, in our bomb. A lot of people wonder why we dropped the second one in Nagasaki. We dropped it to convince the Japanese we had more than one bomb, because the Japanese and everybody else, the Japanese had a program developing an atomic weapon the Russians had one, they had ours, and the, 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 the British had one, everybody had one. And uh, based on uh, their Japanese program, which was uh, based on using uranium, they thought that because uranium was so scarce, they would only, we would only have one of those weapons. And they, that the second one was dropped to convince them that we had more than one. Everything went wrong on that mission. The weather was bad, they wasted a lot of time at the rendezvous because uh, uh, one of the airplanes that wasn't there. And then they went on to Kokur, which had been, uh, uh, well, there had been reported good. The weather had turned sour in the meantime, so they couldn't see the bomb. 
They made three more bomb runs there, chewing up more gas. They decided to go on and bomb at Nagasaki and make a radar run if necessary. And uh, they made a run in the, made, made a run on Nagasaki. At the last minute, the clouds opened up and Kermit Behan saw the ground and he said, "I dropped the bomb visually." Uh, he knows he didn't. We know he didn't. But the war is over. So what? So that's the story of the two, but at two missions. Later on, we, I went up to Japan later on. Uh, I was in, walked around all around Nagasaki before the occupation troops were in, in there or anything of that type. And everybody says, weren't you afraid of radiation? And, you know, at that time we weren't. But that's one of the things the scientists did. They grossly underestimated the effects of radiation at both Hiroshima and Nagasaki. that particular period of time, uh, you would have probably had to look and I might have found a dozen out of a million people who didn't approve the use of the bomb. Everybody approved it. Well, hey, you know, we had broken the Japanese naval code and we had broken the Japanese diplomatic code. So we knew everything the Japanese were doing. We knew all of their plans for the defense of Japan and they, all, these, all the information of breaking those codes was released about after 50 years. So in the mid-90s, why there are a lot of history books being written, or, or should, I should say a lot of books by historians, some of them were history books, some of them weren't, about uh, what the Japanese were doing for the defense. Remember, they had very large land armies. They knew we were coming. They had guns placed exactly for where we were coming. <laughs>
Oh, it would have been a bloody invasion. I'm not sure we'd have made it. When we were rather recruited, I guess I'll call it that anyhow, uh, for this atomic mission. When Paul Tibbs talked to me, he said, I can't tell you what we're going to do. But he said, if it works, we're either going to end or significantly shorten the war. And that was our objective, was to get in there and end or shorten the war. And when the war was over, when the Japanese accepted the terms of unconditional surrender back, you know, on, what, the 13th or so of uh, August, why, you know, we felt very, extremely good about it. I wasn't going to get shot at anymore. And that, that was a bonus in any time. The largest single air raid of the war against Japan was flown after the bomb was dropped at Nagasaki. And we had over, about 1,000 B-29s up over Japan that day. We had so many B-29s up over Japan that day that there was no one target in Japan worth that many B-29s bombing it. So basically they had a lot of different targets. And uh, you never hear of that mission. You never hear the damage it caused. You never hear the destruction it caused the deaths it caused or anything of that type, but uh, uh, it had to be very extensive. Everybody forgets about that mission. And they forget all about all the destruction that was caused, or could have been caused, if the war had continued. If the Japanese had not accepted the terms of unconditional surrender, we had such overwhelming air power over there that a mouse would not have been able to move in Japan without being bombed. We had, they had, the Japanese had no navy anymore, they had no air force anymore except about 6,000 kamikazes that they were going to use against us in an event of invasion. And, uh, but, uh, uh, and, and Doolittle was moving his 8th Air Force over there to Okinawa. There would have been air, air, up airplanes up over Japan all the time, and the, the Japanese would have suffered tremendous losses, not even considering an invasion. And that's the reason why I always say the bomb really saved lives. In spite of the tremendous number of casualties at Japan, at, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, the bomb really saved lives because uh, uh, the destruction that had been caused in Japan otherwise would have been tremendous. I think people need to know what happened. Today, everyone condemns it, especially the young people. They don't study it enough to know why we dropped the bomb. And why we dropped the bomb was there is a war going on. And the only pay I know to win a war is to force the enemy to submit. And it is, it is forcing, too. The Japanese had never surrendered anything before until they surrendered their whole doggone country. The other people that I get a lot of thanks from are American prisoners of war. My name is Edwin A. Petrie, private first class of the 7th Material Squadron. I was captain on Bataan, and uh, on April the 9th, heard it into a big group of men and made the march to San Fernando, 110 kilometers. On the march, there was very many of the men that were sick from malaria. They straggled, they were shot or bayoneted. The drinking water we had came from irrigation ditches, where there were many dead Filipinos, Americans, and Carabao. The march took five days and nights, of which we got about 15 minutes break period to rest about twice a day. We were, were not given any food until we reached San Fernando where we were given a uh, rice ball and a little salt. I was then put on a train and taken to campus at Camp O'Donnell where I stayed five days and then shipped back to Bataan to clean up the battlefield. Made to go around in the hills getting ammunition, guns, anything that we could find and bring them back. I went back to O'Donnell from sickness and stayed until June the 1st, where I was sent to Commander the One, Camp One. I stayed there until August of 43 and was sent to Puerto Princesa, Palawan, where I was put to work on building an airfield. The tools we had were very crude, handmade, no machinery, busting coral with sledgehammers, 
and the work was very hard, in which we got very bad treatment and food. The Japanese would work as hard early hours and come back home late. Often there was no water to take a bath when we got back. And there are many people in the Japanese prison camp for many years putting their work mining coal and uh, do, uh, at that hard labor and everything of that type. And yeah, if you ever meet one of those fellows, I get all kind of thanks. The other people I get a lot of thanks from are uh, a group up in Canada called the uh, August 14th Society. That's the day the Japanese surrendered. And these were people that were in the Dutch East Indies over there and put in the, in, the, in the occupation camps by the Japanese. And most of these people started out, I was a boy of 14 and such and such a camp and the Japanese were no longer feeding us or no longer giving us medical care. They were just guarding us. And uh, I would not have lasted another six months if we, you had not dropped the bomb. We got loaded on a train and this was the most horrible ride. I mean, we got into a, uh, wagons that were boarded up and as I said, we were in the tropics. It was hot. It was all boarded up. We got no food and we got no water. And the train ride to West Java, where we were the next camp, took about 24 hours. And people were Thursday and they, there was no water. People started drinking water out of the toilets. The toilet, whatever water there was, they were drinking it. And, and then you couldn't go to the bathroom, so people were were urinating and, and uh, having bowel movements all over the place. There was things, people were on the floor. And, and because of the heat, it, some of that stuff uh, evaporated, got up on the ceiling and dripped down. It was horrible. And the Japanese came there, they uh, uh, threw us uh, off the truck with all the bags and, and we were treated very badly. And finally, I ended up in a barracks where I had a little space to sleep on the floor. There were three people hanging on poles. They were being whipped. They were screaming from pain, and they were being tortured. And it was horrible. A typical way of forcing people to talk is to hang them and to beat them. Quite often they have burning cigarettes that they put on your body or in your nose or in your ear. One treatment was fairly common. That was, uh, we called it the water treatment. They would lay somebody down on the floor and put a garden hose in his throat and pump water in his throat until this belches up, you know. And then the Japanese soldier will jump on it and, and they jump and all the water comes out to make you talk. And if you don't talk, they do it again. Several people have gone through that kind of treatment. And that was another thing that uh, you hate to think about that you have to go through that, but we had some people nearby that went through that, and some of them, they had permanent problems with their stomach. We attack. And sometimes we fall. As our troops push forward, they leave behind the bodies of their fallen comrades. Don't value your life too highly. That's a hard thing to tell a person. But if you were overseas in the Eighth Air Force uh, back in the early days and you took your value your life very highly, you weren't going to be any good. After my third or fourth mission over there, I, I made up my mind, I'm, I'm going to die doing this anyhow. And this sort of thing. So if, and you're not going there's no way to get out of it or anything of that type. So. Do your job and don't be worried about it too much. A lot of people come back from those missions over there and they'd say, I'll never go on another mission. I'll never go on another mission. And this sort of thing, they'd be worried to death and everything. Well, then they'd sit around for a while and they know they had to get their missions in before they come home. So then they'd say, well, okay, one more. So then you go out and want to fly one more mission. Well, you know, damn good and well. On that mission, they were no good. I'd have hated to put them in the lead airplane up there, I'll tell you that. England was 25 missions. And I had 11 missions out of England when they moved us down to North Africa. Then after North Africa, they decided that uh, they decided uh, all of a sudden that the tour down there would be 50 missions instead of 25 up in England. 
And by that time, I already had 58. So I couldn't fly anymore. So I says, well, I can't fly anymore. Send me home. They says, well, we don't know what to do with you because we have no orders to send you home either. So I toured North Africa for a while. And then finally orders came through to send me home. And uh, Joe DeSalvo and I, we were, uh, we were both, I guess, first lieutenants. Yeah, first, first lieutenants at the time. And uh, 11 enlisted people. And they said, you're responsible for getting these people home. So uh, uh, we went up to uh, Algiers to the headquarters where we got our orders to come home. And I said, to them, where's our transportation? And they says, we don't have any. It's up to you. In other words, you're now in Algiers, you can go home, but you got to hitchhike. And so we flew back to Oregon, but we, everybody in the near, of course, in those days knew everybody else, pretty much, over in England and Africa. And so we, uh, the airplane was going to Iran, so we took the airplane down to Iran. And as we were approaching Iran, why they called in and said, do you have anything going down to uh, Casablanca, because that's closer to home. So he says, yeah, there's a plane here. Uh, we'll hold it, and then can hang down to Casablanca. So we get down to Casablanca, and the uh, guy says, well, the ship down in the harbor. We can get down and get on the ship. I wasn't about to get on any ship for cry crying out loud. But we put the 11 listed guys on the ship, and uh, then I stayed in Casablanca for about three weeks, I guess, Joe and I. And uh, finally we decided, well, we better get, a, better get on with getting home here. So a guy says, well, there's a C-54 down at Marrakesh. If you get down there, you can probably get up to England. So we go out to the uh, base, and uh, a fellow we knew, come find a C-47, came in, and we said, uh, uh, had greeted each other and everything of this type. And then, uh, what are you doing? He says, I'm flying the mail run. I says, we going to, are you going down to Marrakesh? Well, he says, I am if there's any mail for Marrakesh. So he goes in and looks, there's no mail for Marrakesh. So he goes back around the counter and writes out, gets an envelope and writes out a letter and drops it in the slot. And, he goes back and he says, oh, yeah, now there's mail from Marrakesh. <laughs> so then he took us down to Marrakesh. We got a C-54 up to England and then another C-54 back to uh, uh, landed at LaGuardia Field. And we landed at LaGuardia Field. They didn't know what to do with us. We were the first guys to come home. And so the guy says, well, the orders read report, report to the nearest Air Force base. That was uh, an Air Force base out there on uh, Long Island, I think. What was it? Patrick Air Force Base? No, that wasn't it. I forget the name of the base. But anyhow, we go out there and look, and the adjutant out there looks at us and says, I don't know what to do with you guys, and this sort of stuff. So he says, go on home. He says, your orders read, you have 15 days delay en route, so go on home for 15 days, and I'll, I'll get in touch with you. He didn't know we'd already been in class of bank. He has a blanket for about 30 days. And uh, so we went home, and 15 days were up. They didn't get in touch with us. Twenty days were up. Joe DeSalvo called a guy and said, you know, we're up here waiting for orders. When are we going to get them? So the guy says, oh, yeah, gee, I forgot about you guys. And uh, so pretty, pretty soon we get a telegram from them. Your delay en route is hereby extended for 15 more days. And then report to uh, training command headquarters down in Houston. Well, I give Joe, Del Joe DeSalvo the devil for calling the guy. We could have spent the rest of the war at home. Nobody knew where we were, and then I could have gone. Then I could have gone in and collected all my pay, <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't work out that way. I went back to uh, college up in Pennsylvania, Bucknell, and I uh, got a uh, bachelor's and master's degree in chemical engineering and worked for a little old firm called Dupont. I went back to college and it was tough because I tried to pick up or not repeat anything. I tried to pick up and uh, where I left off, and. Uh, to this day, they make me, they may be a chemical engineer, but to this day, there's some, a lot of chemistry I don't know. <laughs> I had a new son. That was, he, he was born the day I left to go over to Tinian. And I went over, Paul Tibbetts and I flew over together. And I, and I know Paul, being the kind of guy he was and everything else, was trying to drag his feet uh, so that I could get word about my son before I left. And I didn't, but I got over there, and uh, I guess my wife thought uh, that, uh, the Red Cross was the easiest way to inform me, so I didn't find out what I, I, I knew I had a son, a child. My wife was writing and said, the baby did this, the baby did that, and that sort of thing, but uh, I didn't know whether it was a son or a daughter or what for almost a month and so on. So, yeah, it was 
it was a thrill coming back and uh, seeing him for the first time. Today, people stay in touch. When you say stay in touch, they have computers, they have cell phones, and all that stuff. We didn't have any of that. You know, we, I, in my home in North Island, Pennsylvania, we didn't have a telephone. Wasn't any good if I'd have had one overseas. But you stayed in touch by writing letters. Mm -hmm. And when you went over there, when you went to one of the over to Europe, for example, you knew you were going to be over there until you flew your quota of missions or until the end of the war. You know, it, there's none of this business of rotating every six months or anything of that type. And uh, you have to understand it was an entirely different war from what you what what we what we've seen ever, ever since. Even Vietnam was nothing like uh, that war. There really was no fun back in those days. If you went down to London, you were exposed to the. I, I at that time they weren't bombing one a month, but every once in a while you get involved in an air raid. And if you went out to Peterborough, which was close to our base, why, yeah, you could get up there and you'd get involved in air raid and things of this type. But uh, uh, they had a lot of things. Uh, Glenn, Miller, Glenn Miller had his band over there and that sort of thing. But uh, I never saw anybody like that. Uh, let's put it this way. You, you, you made your own fun at the base. Um, Tom Farabee was a, an ex-professional ball player. And we always played a lot of baseball and everything of that type. I played first base. I would never get in front of a ball Tom Fairby threw at me. I'd catch the ball like this. I wasn't going to have my head taken off and uh, <laughs> this sort of thing. But uh, we, uh, but you, 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 you essentially, I went over and visited Cambridge a couple of times. And you could do things like that. But, you know, there was no, there was no fun per se, let's put it that way. But was also a feeling that everybody was going to be in it. You know, not right now. Some people are there, some people aren't. In Vietnam, some people are there, some people. My son didn't go to Vietnam. He he he, could, uh, he, he graduated as a lawyer and he made, was made a made a uh, a uh, law clerk for some judge and everything of that type. When they finally did call him up, they finally had flat feet anyhow. So that's another story. But uh, the uh, uh, when I was when, at, at my age, I had to remember the population of this country back in 1940s, about half of what it is today. We didn't have all this traffic out here in Atlanta. I can remember one guy in my group inherited a parking lot downtown Atlanta, and he wondered what he was going to do with it. Hell, if he'd have kept it, he'd be a multimillionaire today. But uh, anyhow, uh, uh, we all knew we were going to be in it. The draft, if we, if we weren't drafted, and I never was drafted, I didn't even have a draft number. But uh, if you were drafted, we all knew that everybody was going to be treated the same. You were going to either be in an essential job, in some way, shape, or form, you're going to be in the service. <laughs> no, I married a girl I'd been going with in high school all those years, this sort of thing. And it was funny because I was stationed down at uh, Monroe, Louisiana, and I couldn't get leave to go home and get married or anything of this type. So she came down there to visit, and we got married in Shreveport, Louisiana. And uh, uh, sometimes, uh, you know, the minister would marry you without any questions asked or anything of that type. And uh, depending on uh, other, other ministers would be interested in the couple and everything of that type. Did you know each other more than two hours or something of that type? So... Uh, uh, and then after you got married, you had to find a place to live. And I can remember that at Thunder, Louisiana, we rented a place that was built just for quarters for the officers there and everything of that type. New furniture, it had no springs, no springs whatsoever, and everything of that type. So it, uh, uh, it was different. During that period of time, the people got together and all made their own entertainment. And I always say that uh, Wendover, Utah had a population of 104, and it looked like a Bob Hope call at the end of the earth, I think it was. But uh, it was one of the best places I ever was because we were there. We knew we were there, and we made our own entertainment. We played baseball. We had we burned down the officers' club, too. That's another story. <laughs> and, uh, but we were all in the thing together, so we all knew what we had to do. In certain cases, some people have too much liberty today. 
you know, I, I don't think that uh, liberty gives you the right to do all of those things if they are obviously false. He's doing what I want to do, when I want to do it, saying what I want to do, when I want to say it, and that type of thing. And forming my own ideas, not being forced or spoon-fed a bunch of ideas of somebody else.